in the round the town of Albert with about 150 heavy-duty lorries, 10 tonners, carrying petrol and food from railhead to forward dumps. Things were working quite well. But when the Germans broke through, we were directly in the line of advance. The Germans started bombing Albert 10 or 15 times a day with fairly heavy bombs, and they were particularly savage with some of the factories around the town. They began to be quite regular in their bombing raids. They always had one at half past six in the evening, for instance. However, we had no casualties from these raids. After a few days of this, we were ordered to move back. We had an hour to move off and left in the afternoon. I set off with 13 lorries, lorries towards Doulance. The roads were all choked with civilian refugees. In fact, I think the congestion on the roads was one of the worst things we had to deal with. However, we got to Doulance safely, loaded up with food, and travelled through the night without lights, of course, by the St. Paul Road to Piermont Village, and there we spent two days establishing a dump. One of the trickiest jobs with lorries the size of ours is to hide them successfully. We put them in sunken roads and under trees and wherever we could get deep shadows. I think we can say we were pretty successful at this because although we had a reconnaissance plane over looking for what it could find, it didn't seem to find much in Piermont. But there were a hundred tons of petrol in that village, a hundred and thirty tons of rations, and 360-odd stone jars of rum. We spent two or three days in Piermont. We spent a number of days after that moving over the country and to the Forêt de Lique, where we hid the lorries under the trees. While we were there, we heard a German, that a German armoured car was within five kilometres. I set out with a light lorry and a Lewis gun and a party of men to try and find it. We didn't find the armoured car, fortunately, and after some time we gave up the search and were returning to the column when my motorcyclist told me that between us and the wood were two German tanks. He said that they were stationary and that the crews were out of them. We drew our lorry across the road and then we advanced on foot on both sides of the road between the high banks, looking down towards the road, and then I saw the tanks for the first time. Our party had rifles with them, and we fired several shots at the crews of the tanks, but by this time the Germans were getting into their machines and moving off towards the wood. Just at that moment, a reconnaissance plane came down over us with its machine gun firing. That took our attention off the tanks for a moment, and then, just afterwards, I saw ahead on the road a convoy of vehicles blazing after they had been fired at by the machine guns on the tanks. A few minutes later, I heard heavy firing going on in the wood. I decided that it would be dangerous and unreasonable to try and follow the tanks into the wood, so I moved my party away to the right and into the wood by means of a side road. We stopped in the wood and went on foot through it to try and find the rest of our company. But we lost direction and came out over the road which we had originally been using where we saw the blazing lorries still burning by the roadside. We moved back and went to, to our own vehicles and then set off down the road towards Calais. Some distance out of the wood and in a small village we stopped at a farmhouse to try and find out what was happening. We were fortunate enough to get some beer. And while we were drinking this and getting what information we could, one of my men reported that there were two, that there was two tanks, one of which was coming down the road towards us and only about 200 yards away. We immediately dived into our vehicles and almost left behind two men who wanted to finish their beer, but fortunately they got on board and then we started off down the road to Calais, and this time we reached it safely. At this time, I was in the wood, talking to the second in command. We'd gone deeper in to take cover from an aeroplane. After a moment, we didn't hear the aeroplane, but we heard the firing, and then I saw the first tank coming towards the wood, firing its four-pounder, and a moment after a second tank. Our chaps all took cover in the wood. They had their rifles with them, and whenever they could, they were shooting at the tanks. One of the section sergeants was badly wounded while he was trying to mount a lorry which carried a machine gun. As I got deeper into the wood, I saw another tank covering the road to Cali. It was in a clearing. The scrap in the wood went on for a long time. And at last I got lost. It was dark by this time, and I went to sleep at the foot of a tree. 
I was awakened by a noise like an aeroplane. And when I fully woke up, I discovered it was one of the tanks. It stopped about 30 yards in front of me. Very soon, another one drew up alongside. I don't move. I had no arms with me except the revolver. And I heard the Germans filling up the tank and moving around. Then I heard an aeroplane come near. And one of the men from the tanks came out into the open. And with a thing like a big phosphorescent plate, he seemed to be signaling to the plane. I lay there for about two and a half hours until there was absolute quiet around those tanks, and then I crawled towards the edge of the wood and made my way across the fields to Guise, where I persuaded a Belgian refugee to take me into Calais, and there I made a report about the position of the tanks to headquarters. I was driving a subaltern back to our headquarters in the Leek Forest in an Austin 7. We were travelling pretty fast, about two miles ahead of our convoy when suddenly I saw a German tank standing just off the side of the road. The gunner was in the conning tower, brandishing two terrific automatic pistols in a very businesslike manner. He put a couple of bullets through the engine before we had time to do anything, and the next thing I knew I was in the ditch and my officer had been captured. I heard the German asking where I was, and within a moment the tank started firing its machine gun into my ditch. A bullet glanced off my helmet and another grazed my face. So I thought it uh, about time to come out. The Germans ordered the two of us to walk down into the road, into the village. They had taken away the officer's revolver. When we came to the village, we thought we'd do a sharp left turn and get out of sight. But there was another tank waiting there, so we went on through the village, thinking we might do a sharp right turn to the same effect. We did so, but no, there was another tank there. So we went on into the village again, and this time we tried to get into a house. We went through the house and into the garden. There was no cover there at all except a very large rabbit hutch. So we crawled under that and kept very still. We lay under that rabbit hutch for about two hours while the Germans walked around us not more than ten yards away. In the second hour, there was quite a battle between the tanks and a French anti-tank gun which we had passed along the road. When it was all quiet again at dusk, we crawled out and made across country towards Berg. After dark, we marched on the North Star. We got to Berg at dawn, and there a car gave us a lift to Dunkirk. I am a junior officer in a field ambulance, and only went out to France in the middle of April. We were on the Belgian frontier when the big show started, and got up to Tournai as fast as we could, where we established a main dressing station and an advanced dressing station. There we were badly bombed all the time, but went on dealing with casualties, both civilian and military. After five days there, we could we got back to somewhere near Lille and had numerous casualties from, from bombing during our four or five days in that district. On the way back, we had a very startling experience, as while we left one end of the village, the Hun came in the other. So we destroyed all our supplies, but kept our vehicles. With us, we had a very charming brown kitten, which we had brought from England. And while we were leaving the village, a shell burst amongst us, and the kitten ran out and was lost. Three days later, as we heard they hadn't been driven out of this village, we went back to see if we could find anything of our equipment or anything, anything else. And there, sitting in the ruins of our house, was our precious mascot, which seemed to recognize us at once, and which we carefully packed into one of our vans. I'm not quite certain where the cat is now, but I believe one of the other fellows brought it back to England. At Dunkirk, we formed an MDS and two ADSs just outside the town where we had an, an enormous number of casualties to deal with and were being persistently bombed and shelled all the time. Here, we were pretty short of food and lived mostly on biscuits. But I, I must say that when we were up near Lille, we had a splendid time as far as food is concerned. We killed cattle and pigs and ate anything we could find. When we, was, when we withdrew from Dunkirk, we destroyed our lorries and gave the remains of our medical supplies to the casualty clearing station. From the beach, we saw people leaving in all sorts of peculiar boats, some of them even setting out to road to England. I left on a very crowded cross channel ship and had never realized before what a beautiful thing it can be to land in a country like England. Now, I was a sergeant in charge of a section. Um, we thought we were going to stay 
through and either be killed or captured, if we thought at all. We, you know, you're bound to wonder if you're going to get away. But it was time was getting a bit short. Um, we didn't know what the situation was on the beach. We had fought a rear guard right the way down from Louvain, as, as far as I can remember. Uh, and it was a Friday during the evening when a company commander's conference was called for, I went to it. And we were told that we were leaving the following day. We were, in fact, leaving Fern that night to march down to the beach. Um, we, uh, I can't remember the time, but it was during the night we formed up as a battalion uh, in companies, platoons and so on, split up either side of the road, the usual thing, single file. And we marched from Fern down to La Panne, a little village on the beach. This was very grim because um, it seemed to me that it was probably the only road open to us. Uh, and the Germans knew that we would use it as a route and they plastered it. The shelling was very heavy, but it always seemed to be ahead of us. The road twisted and turned a great deal. Um, and I thought, this I can remember very clearly, I thought we were walking straight into an inferno and I got very cross, very angry, because I was frightened, I suppose. Um, as I say, it always seemed to twist, the road always seemed to twist away from where we thought, where I thought the shells were bursting. Uh, this is quite true, we went, I went right through that and uh, um, I wasn't hurt and as far as I can remember I didn't see anyone hurt, but we always, to me, looked as if we were walking straight into it. We, I got caught, my rifle got caught, the, the nozzle of my rifle got caught in a bit of wire that was hanging down. You know what it's like, the, wherever there's been shelling, the telegraph wires hang around on the road. I got caught in it uh, and couldn't get out, and the more I tried to get out, the more I got tangled up. It was, it was in fact, round my neck when I'd finished, and I was utterly panic-stricken, swearing, cursing everybody because the blokes were just marching by naturally it was tramp 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 and I, I was being left and my great fear was to be in one spot for more than two seconds because the law of averages I thought this is going to be the spot that will get the next salvo. Uh, a, a company sergeant major got me out of that very calm and collected and came up and unwound me and that but that's the main recollection of that road. We arrived on the beach I don't know what time I would think about two in the morning um, and there were people, officers, calling out uh, this way, number two company, this way, the grenadiers, and so on, the usual sort of assembly point noises. Um, very shortly after that, I heard someone call out that the, the planes were coming over, we must keep still. The sand was very wet. It was a bright night, and if you moved, your footprints made phosphorescent sort of shimmers, you know, which was as good as flares to the pilot. We laid flat on the ground. Um, the next thing I remember are the horses. Um, how many there were, I don't know. I remember on the march down from way back inland, all the animals were being driven with us. It was very much like a forest fire, that this, this German panzer set up, so that animals, human beings, and the lot were all being driven forward to the sea. I remember seeing dead animals, horses and things lying around, the, the same as one saw men. Um, so I think that what had happened was that certain of the animals, like certain of the human beings, had arrived at the beach. And the thing I remember about the horses were that they'd raced past us up and down, uh, and quite a number of men were, at any rate, injured, I think killed, by simply getting a horse's hoof through their skulls. Um, there were pigs and sheep and, and various other things down there, chickens too. It was, it was a chaotic setup on the beach. Um, we arrived on the beach as a battalion, uh, perfectly orderly. We went back off the beach to the other side of the dunes to rest, to, to hole up where we would be less likely to get a bit of shrapnel and get some sleep. Uh, wait till light and then weigh up the situation and see what we could do. I had then got my men with me. We, we snuggled down into the sand, that's about the only way you can describe it, and we went to sleep. Um, I don't know for how long, very short, and I think a bit dozy waking up and, and 
so on things woke us up. Uh, I called the roll at first light. I don't know what time. Uh, there were two or three of my chaps missing. Uh, one of the chaps I remember saying, uh, telling me that one of them had been killed or he thought he'd been killed. Two others had gone off, I think he said, I think they'd gone for water or they'd gone scrounging around somewhere. Anyway, uh, there was a nurse there who had been sleeping with us, apparently. Uh, I remember the thing that I remember about her is that when I was calling the role, one of the chaps uh, said rather jokingly he'd got a headache. I, I said something about, is everybody all right? Um, and this nurse said, does anybody want an aspirin? And then we discovered that she'd been sleeping there with us, and, and um, her name was Dorothy, and she shot off somewhere else. Um, now, the scene, early in the morning, this would be the Saturday as Dunkirk, I remember, I think, finished on the Sunday, really, to all intents and purposes. That Saturday morning, I remember giving a bit of time to looking at the scene purely from the point of view of appreciating the drama of it. I was frightened, but for one moment or two, I was not sufficiently frightened to stand and watch uh, this scene. It was fantastic. It was slightly misty. The ships were lined up, I don't know how far, 200, 300 yards out, uh, in a great long line, level with the beach. The men were lined up in great wadges, level with the seashore, and the men were going in, apparently, into Dunkirk to the left, and the ships were going into Dunkirk and they were meeting there and loading up. That, I think, was the plan. I'm not sure, but that's what it looked like. The ships were being heavily attacked by aircraft, um, tracers, shells, and all the rest of it, and blow-ups. We saw several ships go up there. This was a fabulous scene in the early morning. Um, Dunkirk, as it got lighter, Dunkirk itself looked to me to be a complete... Um, I had not been issued with any specific orders because uh, one assumes that, that uh, the officers expected the whole of us, all the groups of us to keep together and we would be ordered here, there and everywhere as we went along. Um, but my own sense told me that one had to march into Dunkirk to get on a ship. On the other hand, there were a great many queues already out going out into the water, blokes up waist high. And I was rather inclined to join one of these queues. Now, I'll tell you why. I'm a very strong swimmer. Dunkirk looked most in uninviting. The job, it seemed to me, was to get away and get to England. I was responsible for, at that point, about half a dozen men. Um, and I thought, well, we'll go and join this queue and get on a, uh, one of the, the long boats or dinghies or whatever they were that the ships were sending over to the shore. This is what we did. We, we went down to the beach. We tagged on to a queue. It was a bit zigzaggy, so the next thing that happened was a bullet zipped into the water beside me. I heard the crack of the gun, and sure enough, there was an officer who'd actually fired his revolver at me. I'm quite sure not, with no intent to hit me, but uh, it shook me. I, was, I had jumped the queue. He told me in no uncertain terms that I had jumped it, and I was to get my men back up the hell out of it and, and join on in the proper place. Um, the queue was a very long one, and we, in the short time we were with it, they were passing stretchers over our heads with wounded people on to go out to the boats. And I remember the German planes shot up the queues, um, which was a, a nasty business. Uh, you were pretty helpless when you're up to your chest in water, and all one could do would be to duck under the water. Well, we, we got away with that. As far as I know, uh, all my chaps got away with it, because when I said, come on, we'll go back up to the dunes and have another think. Uh, and as, again, as far as I know, they were all there when we got back. Oh, I said, can, any, can, can you all swim? Not one of them could swim. Uh, a little while later, one of them said, there's a boat out there. And there was a boat out there floating around, looking very spare. Uh, and I said, right, well, I'll go and get it. It was only a hundred yards or so out. So I stripped off, literally stripped off naked. I kept my tin hat on because th this is a great comfort uh, when things are flying about, um, psychologically. 
and uh, I left my clothes with the corporal, Corporal Martin, um, and told him to wait there until I got back with the boat. I swam out for this boat. When I got to it, there were a couple of soldiers in it, and there were also two dead bodies in it, which they were busy heaving out. Um, uh, they were obviously going to take it somewhere else. One of them was all for letting me get in, the other one wasn't, and the moment I mentioned that I got some men on the beach, that was the end of that. There was no question of them coming back with me to the beach, the beach to pick my men up. So I abandoned this boat because I felt that I was in full view of the bloke sitting back on the beach and I didn't want to arrive back in England uh, and have a couple of, of my chaps level a charge of having deserted them or something. I, I didn't think this out very clearly, but um, that's why I went back to the beach, because of responsibility of three stripes. Um, when I got back to the beach, I must have been carried about half a mile or so nearer to Dunkirk because I, when I got out of the water, I didn't know where I was. I couldn't see anybody I knew or recognize anything. Uh, but I did realize that the tide had probably carried me down a bit, so I began to walk back. And eventually, I came across Martin sitting there with my clothes, rather like a terrier. Uh, but everybody else had gone, and he said that they chased up into the, the dunes because the Germans had strafed the beach and, and, and so on. And uh, he carefully said that he also had gone, but he'd come back. Well, that left the two of us, and I, s I, I decided not to go and look for the men. It was pretty hopeless business. The, the beach was very crowded, and, and I, they knew where we were. And I thought, well, they're, they're all right, you know, I hope. Um, we, we sat there for, for some little time deciding what to do. I was, at that point, all for walking into Dunkirk because I couldn't leave Martin. Uh, and I said, well, come on, we'll march into Dunkirk. And uh, he said, will you swim out with me? Well, eventually I made a, a, an agreement with him that if he took all his clothes off, uh, I would swim with him. I was loaded up with um, a good many things. I, I'd got a, a, a pack full of stuff that we'd lifted, I, I'm sorry to say, but there it was, that we we were billeted at one point in a cellar above which was a, a fur store and a jewellery store, and somebody had said, what we don't have, the Germans will. This is a reprehensible thing, but there it was, and I loaded my pack up with the best bracelets and wristwatches I could find. I also had a, a 12 pelt fox fur, silver fox fur cape wrapped up in my gas cap. I wasn't going to drop this lot if I could avoid it. Um, Martin, I made him take all his kit off. We, I'm afraid, we threw away our rifles. This was a dreadful thing, of course, but since I had no ammunition, I really didn't see any point in perhaps being drowned by the weight of a couple of rifles. Um, we were very short of ammunition the whole way through that lot. So we dumped all this, and Martin, quite naked, and I set off, uh, and I probably half drowned him on the way out, ducking him here and there, but he was alive and safe and sound when we were picked up by a long boat. I call it a long boat. It was a very, it was a very big boat, a sort of thing that the Navy has, a very big, strong oars. Uh, there was a brigadier in charge of this, a big white-haired chap. He said, after they'd hauled in Martin, he said to me, you'll have to drop your kit, Sergeant. So um, I should say I was wearing full battle dress stripes and the lot, you see. So uh, reluctantly, I undid my belt and let the whole thing slip off, and I got into the boat. The next thing that happened was that we went out and we went near the stern of a destroyer that I think was called the Ivanhoe. Um, and I heard, uh, oh, in between that, after we began to pull towards the destroyer, I was very frightened by planes. I, I didn't like this business of being dive bombed, just sitting in a boat. There wasn't much one could do, but the one thing that I've managed to do was to change places with a bloke and start rowing. Um, and then we were stopped by a loud hailer from the destroyer. W the chap said, I'm on the mud, I'm churning up to get off, wait until we're clear, something like that. So the brigadier ordered us to stop rowing. Then what happened was that some fool on, on the tiller allowed the boat to drift in towards the destroyer, which was, in fact, churning up like mad. 
And the very next thing I remember is my oar, to which I was hanging on rather grimly, caught in the uh, at the boat. The, the, the boat we were in swung in rather rapidly and smashed in against the side of the destroyer, and the oar caught in the side, and I was pulled up, rather sort of catapulted, a few feet, I don't know how far, but anyway, literally heaved up out of my seat, and I grabbed, and I grabbed a grid on the side of the destroyer which acted as a ladder. I don't know what it was, but I would call it a grid, and I was aboard like a jackrabbit, um, staggered across the deck, and the next thing I heard was a great deal of shrieking and shouting, and I turned round, and there were several sailors leaning over the side of which I just climbed, looking down, they'd got a rope overboard, and I went to look over, and what I saw Corporal Martin clinging onto this rope with about six boats clinging round his neck, and I saw them sink, and they went under the propellers. Um, then uh, I, I was soaking, and I took off my clothes, and the sailor gave me a blanket and a packet of cigarettes, and he said I could get some tea in the galley if I wanted it. How soon after, not very long, I think, um, it, it, the ship was hit. I understood that the ship got a bomb straight down her funnel, which went out of the bottom of the ship and burst, uh, and didn't kill anyone, or, or didn't do much damage except to the ship, and she was able to be, they, they, they kept the Ivanhoe afloat by bringing two ships alongside, one either side, and they got the men off. This I don't know about for certain, because the moment I saw a sailor sit down and take his boots off, I went over the side. Um, I was away, stark naked, without even a bow a hat, a tin hat. And I swam away, madly away from this ship. I remember thinking that, that you got caught in a whirlpool or something, and I was furiously pedalling away to get away out of this. And then I collected my senses a bit and had a look round, and, and there, of course I was surrounded by a ship. The nearest was a, a, a trawler, which I swam to, and a very kind old gentleman, Scotsman, said, uh, asked me if I was tired, uh, because if I wasn't, he'd got rather too many aboard, and he didn't want to take any more, and there was a much bigger one, he said, over there, and he pointed to a ship, and I went to it, swam to it. I, could, I quite felt I could swim to England that day very easily. I swam to this, to this minesweeper, it was, the Speedwell, and was taken aboard, was herded down below, uh, where, right at the bottom, I imagine, where we were absolutely packed, literally like sardines, we were sort of limb to limb and so on, and could hardly move and breathe. The ship started moving and swaying around, bombs and shells, I suppose, were going off outside in the sea, and every time one did, the it seemed as if we'd been hit. In fact, I think the ship was weaving, zigzagging, and that probably gave the impression because a noise went off somewhere close by just at the point where she zigzagged. It, it felt to us as if we were, you know, we'd been hit. And this was a terrible position to be in if you were going to be killed. It was about the worst way you could be, to be jammed in the bottom of a ship. Next, someone asked for volunteers to go up and man the small arm stuff that, we'd, that they'd got on the decks, Bren guns, Lewis guns, that sort of thing, they'd all mounted. Anybody that brought a gun aboard, they'd mounted them up, upstairs for the aircraft. And I leapt at this. I, I went up, um, acted as a sort of number two on a Bren gun for a little while, much to the, the amusement of everybody, because, as I say, I was stark naked. Um, a sailor, I remember, came up and said, haven't you got any clothes? And, and that was the first, really, first time I was conscious of being naked and he gave me a pair of slacks and a sweater which is what I arrived at Dover in. Um, the ship had gone into Dunkirk Harbour that was why all the row was going on. We thought that we were on the way to England for a couple of hours but in fact she'd just been working her way round into the harbour and it was a terrible disappointment to everybody. Anyway we stood in the harbour for some time we lay in the harbour taking aboard a lot more men there are two things I remember particularly about the harbour, standing up on the deck. One was seeing three men unload boxes, and a bomb burst, or it may have been a shell, uh, killing them, or anyway, knocking them out, and one of the boxes bursting, and a lot of lavatory paper falling out of it. The other thing was a beautiful little river craft, pleasure craft, yacht, 
with three boys in white cricket shirts and flannels uh, punting away. I shouldn't think they could have taken more than four people. It was a pretty crowded business. I did see a lot of other things, things like seeing um, bodies floating around looking rather weird with their hair uh, floating like weed on the sea and so on, and, and seeing ships go up too. I saw a ship which was there one second and the next second it wasn't there. This, this I, I shall always remember. We pulled out of the harbour. Uh, I stayed up on deck right the way over. We got to Dover and then much to my surprise and considerable discomfort, the guards, my battalion, marched off, or as many as were on that boat, marched off the ship in full fighting kit and in good order, marched onto the quayside while I hid behind a, um, one of these ventilators, peeping round the corner, horribly embarrassed in a blue sweater and a pair of grey flannels, and I never dared to join them for that reason. But I was thoroughly ashamed of myself seeing all these people all lined up, you know. And, uh, eventually I got on a train and um, that's it. <laughs>